Back in 2003, before any of us were born, there was a massive blackout that took out power in much of the American Northeast, Midwest, and Ontario, Canada. What happened? Well, the short answer is, an Ohio-based energy provider, First Energy, sucked a lot and blew it. For the longer answer, you first need to know a few things. First off, a big picture thing. The electrical grid of North America is a giant interconnected system that all works together dynamically to provide power to everyone except Texas. And that's important because one kind of weird thing about most electrical power is that once it's made, it needs to immediately be used, like Neapolitan pizza or electricity. Our electrical grid system doesn't really store power. Power is being produced and then immediately sent and consumed, and there's a big complicated system to make sure that at all times, the amount of power being produced exactly matches matches the amount of power being used. Second off, a smaller picture thing. If a power line gets overloaded with too much current, that is very bad and dangerous because high current means high heat, which can make the metal in the wire expand, making the wire sag and then hit things below it, causing something called a flashover, which can set things on fire, and apart from very specific camping and zombie killing related circumstances, things being set on fire is bad. So typically, to prevent that, if a line's current gets too high, it'll trip, essentially getting cut off from the grid before it can do too much damage. It's like when you plug two hair dryers or one fork into a single outlet. Your breaker trips because you're trying to pull too much electricity. All right, now to what happened. So at 1.31 p.m. on August 14th, 2003, a power generating plant in East Lake, Ohio went down for reasons that are confusing and not that important because things like this happen sometimes and normally shouldn't be a huge deal. But that meant that other plants had to pick up the slack, sending extra electricity through some of their lines that would ultimately go to the area that the now down power plant should have covered. But that led to some lines being overloaded, including one line, the Hannah Juniper line, which started to sag, hit overgrown trees that First Energy should have been trimming, and then was tripped and cut off. That led to its load being distributed to other lines, which were then dealing with too much load, so they got overloaded and tripped, so their load went to other lines, which also got overloaded and tripped, and so on and so on as it rippled out like a ripple in a ripple pond. By around 4.10 p.m., so many lines had tripped that some of the plants didn't have enough places to send their power, so they stopped generating, but then to make up for that sudden power deficit, East Coast power plants sent a massive surge of power, overloading them, and all of that basically cascaded out and out and out, until entire grids were separating from entire other grids to avoid damage, and by 4.13 p.m., 256 power plants were offline, 55 million people were without power, and sadly, it was seven minutes too early for people to have been able to enjoy how frickin' trippy the whole thing was. Now, all of this should not have been possible, but was made possible by a combination of negligence from various players, mainly First Energy, where an unnoticed software bug in their energy management system meant their control room software didn't alert them to the problem when it was still regional, which meant the people whose job it was to fix the problem had no idea what was going on, and didn't realize there was an issue until, and this is true, the power in their own control room went out. It also didn't help that as it spread out, the regional operator, Midwest ISO, had the tool that would monitor grid problems turned off because, and this is also true, an employee forgot to turn it back on and then went to lunch. The consequences of 55 million people losing power were, as you might imagine, distinctly not amazing. In New York, thousands were trapped underground in dark subways and elevators and had to be evacuated. In Cleveland, where water runs on electric pumps, people had limited water access and had to boil all the water from their taps for four days. And all over, people were unable to stream Netflix as they had no power and also it hadn't been invented yet. Within about seven hours, around midnight Eastern time, most places had restored power, although it wasn't until the next day that New York City and Toronto had full power again. Restarting power after a massive blackout is much more difficult than after a small blackout, because the thing about restarting electricity generators is that it usually requires, well, electricity. While it's kind of a snake or electric eel eating its own tail situation, normally it isn't a huge problem, as down power plants can get power from other plants in the grid. But if all the plants are out, a black start must be conducted using special, typically diesel fuel generators kept on site at some plants, who must get themselves running, then send enough power to restart another generator, who then sends power to restart the next plant, and so on. It's like a candlelight Christmas Eve service where you have to pass the fire around until everything is lit up, except instead of everyone peacefully singing the first Noel at the end, everyone angrily yells about why it took so long to get their TV back on. I mean, what are we supposed to do? Read? Of course, the fact that you're watching this right now means that you do have power and internet and don't have to worry about entertaining yourself with dead trees. That's also good because it means you can do something about any money just sitting around in your bank accounts. As you probably know, doing nothing with your savings really means you're losing money relative to inflation, so the responsible thing to do with your extra cash is to put it to work with some long-term investing. 
Our sponsor, Wealthfront, makes that ridiculously simple. Let's take a look at a product demo Wealthfront put together so I can show you all what their clients are experiencing. You can see their app summarizes what hypothetical me has in cash and investments, as well as what my current liabilities are, so I can quickly see what my net worth is. Of course, the standout feature of Wealthfront is its ability to automatically create portfolios of investments that suit your preferences. For example, I could pick a socially responsible portfolio, customize the risk level anywhere between 1 and 10, and even go in and manually change the breakdown between different ETFs. All around, I think Wealthfront is one of the best money management options out there, so I'd encourage you to try them out, especially considering that by clicking the button on screen or heading to invest.wealthfront.com/hai, you'll get your first $5,000 managed for free.